Hi students and welcome to lab one. I want to start off with is if you are in my class, please make sure that you watch the syllabus lecture that's underneath the syllabus tab um, in either Blackboard or Canvas um, or for whichever lecture you're in, please watch the syllabus lecture for your TA's class. All right, let's get started on plate tectonics. All right. So why does understanding plate tectonics even matter? Well, geologists use the theory of plate tectonics to recreate Earth's history so that they can understand future issues that have to do with geology. In modern day geosciences, understanding plate tectonics helps scientists mitigate natural disasters. Uh, different plate boundaries are associated with particular hazards. Living in San Diego, if you do live here now, uh, you should all be familiar with the San Andreas Fault. Um, understanding plate tectonics can tell you why a hazard like the San Andreas Fault is located in California and how it may act in the future based on how it's acted in the past. Uh, during this lecture, we will learn more about the Earth, how Earth plates interact. Um, and if you look at this video, it's or this image, uh, it's really pretty cool. This is a scuba diver who is uh, swimming through the North American plate and Eurasian plate boundary in Iceland uh, within a mid-Atlantic rift. <clears throat> so to get started, we'll go over Earth's internal structure. Uh, the Earth's internal structure can be subdivided into uh, two parts, uh, its composition and its behavior. Composition meaning uh, the elements, the minerals, and the rocks that build the layer, and the behavior being, it, is it rigid? Is it plastic? Does it move uh, when you apply force? Um, here we're gonna go just through the bound, <clears throat> through the concentric layers uh, from outermost to innermost. First, we have the crust. Uh, the crust is where we live. It's where the biosphere is. Uh, <clears throat> it's really the best layer of the earth. Um, so the, Crust is the rigid outer shell where we live. Um, it contains both oceanic and continental crusts. It's composed of 45 to 52% silicate liquid and enriched with iron and magnesium, making it much denser th than continental crust, which contains 65 to 75% sil silicate minerals. Uh, so that means that your oceanic crust is much heavier than your <clears throat> continental crust. Uh, next we have the mohorific boundary, aka the moho. Uh, this is not necessarily a layer, but it is a very important boundary. Uh, it is the boundary between the crust and the mantle, and it signifies a change in physical properties, primarily a change between the crust and the mantle. So see the crust is very rigid, and when we get to the mantle it's, uh, it's much less rigid. Uh, the mantle makes up 82% of the Earth's interior and is broken up into two sections. It's got the upper mantle, which is rigid, and the lower mantle, which is plastic, which means that it's bendy and it can flow. Uh, the mantle changes behavior with increasing temperature and pressure. So as you go deeper into the Earth's core, uh, these layers are going to encounter higher temperatures and higher pressures, which actually makes the rocks uh, more plastic, and it's very important in plate tectonics. Uh, the composition of the mantle is less than 45% silicate minerals. Uh, then we have the core. Um, the core is divided into two sections, the outer and the inner core. The outer core being liquid and the inner core being solid, not hollow, as you see in Journey to the Center of the Earth 2. Um, the liquid outer core being composed of iron nickel and the inner solid uh, of iron and nickel alloy. So here's one of the first activities in your lab. Uh, <clears throat> I just want you to go through and label uh, what you think each of these are based on the layers we just talked about. Uh, <clears throat> you can just label these A. B, C, D, E um, in your sec in your 
lab section if you are not doing this by hand. <clears throat> Next, we'll go on to isostasy. Isostasy refers to the state of gravitational equilibrium between Earth's lithosphere and asthenosphere. It is a state, oh, sorry, it is a state of gra gravitational equilibrium in which an area of crust floats in a balanced way on the denser rock of the mantle. The elevation of any part of the Earth's crust is a function of its thickness and density of the rock. Uh, you will play around with this concept during the lab, and at the end of this lecture, I will flip through the lab a little bit so that you understand uh, where we talk about isostasis. <clears throat> so the development of plate tectonics was realized um, based on paleomagnetic data. Uh, <clears throat> so as new crust forms um, in mid-Atlantic ridges, um, and it, it's molten lava that's pushed to the seafloor, and as it hits the seafloor, it rapidly cools, and this um, oceanic crust is very high in iron and magnesium, and these minerals will actually align with the North and South Pole. So <clears throat> by looking at uh, the oceanic crust, you can understand the age of the rocks and also the magnetic polarity. So it records the changes in polarity uh, throughout Earth's history. Uh, so now we'll get into more of the tectonic plates. Um, the Earth's crust is composed of a mosaic of plates of various sizes, shapes, and thicknesses. Uh, these plates, since they're on the crust, are rigid. Um, they consist of both oceanic and continental crusts. Uh, they all move relative to each other, and they all interact, and these interactions are really important to understand. So here, as you can see, these arrows that point together, uh, these are convergent boundaries, so that means that these two plates are smashing together. Um, if you see them moving apart, as in, in the Pacific, uh, this is a divergent plate boundary, and these plate boundaries are moving away from each other. And as if you see where we live in Southern California, along our California coast, uh, these two arrows are moving, are pointing in opposite directions, which means a transverse boundary, um, or like a slight strike, slip, salt. <clears throat> so here we'll go into the age of the sea floor. Uh, the red is indicating the youngest, and as you go out from the red, it gets older and older. Uh, it's important to note uh, that these boundaries are along um, uh, oceanic ridges. So here we have the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, which we know is a spreading center. The new uh, oceanic crust is being formed in this area. And right along the ridge, you've got the youngest material going out to the oldest material. Uh, so as you can see, the <clears throat> mid-ocean ridges, moors, uh, match up quite well with the age of the seafloors. So uh, with the age of seafloor, there is <clears throat> new seafloor being built. Um, and then you have the opposite, which is the discovery of deep sea trenches where, uh, <clears throat> where tectonic plates are actually being recycled and they're being pushed back down into the mantle. Uh, so here we'll get into a little bit more detail. Uh, <clears throat> it's pretty interesting. Um, these occur dominantly in the Pacific Ocean. They mimic edges of land masses and they're associated with volcanic chains. So you can actually see here the, Euro the Pacific plate is being pushed down below the Eurasian plate and this is causing mountain building which creates the Japanese island, uh, islands. Uh, <clears throat> uh, and you can see that Pactan plates are recycled um, throughout Earth's history. So they've been pushed underneath other plates, melted back down into mantle, and then in other spots, a uh, new uh, crust is being formed. So it's important to note that uh, plate tectonics uh, creates a lot of different landscapes and creates different hazards. 
So at a convergent uh, plate boundary, you might see a lot of mountains, such as the Himalayan mountains. Um, also, in a co convergent oceanic, you may get volcanoes, much like we saw in Japan. The Japanese islands are formed due to subduction. Um, and then a transform plate boundary, like we have on our California coast, creates a lot of earthquakes. Um, the sliding of the Pacific plate along the North American plate creates a lot of different earthquakes. So now we'll go into convergent plate boundaries. Um, large stresses are built up by convergent, leading to significant earthquake activities, such as in uh, Nepal, Japan, Cascadia, which is Pacific Northwest. Uh, so we have the ocean to continent volcanic complexes, which are created, which is what we have uh, or had um, a very long time ago in California, which created uh, the Sierra Nevadas. Uh, we have ocean and ocean, which is island volcanic complexes. Uh, this is what created Japan. And then continent to continent um, <clears throat> create non volcanic complexes. Uh, that's where we get the Himalayas, where the Indian Australian plate is actually moving north and ramming into the Eurasian plate, creating the Himalayas. Uh, so now we have convergent ocean to continental. As you can see, the denser oceanic crust is actually being forced down below the lighter continental crust. It's remelting. Um, and then that hot lava that's melting from the friction caused by that oceanic plate subduction uh, is rising up through the mantle and the crust and creating uh, mountain buildings and volcanoes. Uh, so now we have convergent ocean to ocean. Um, here it's a little bit harder because both of these are very dense crustal layers. And so you'll get um, <clears throat> this forearm basin, but you'll have the same uh, volcanic complex occurring in this spot. Uh, so here's a really interesting map of active volcanoes, plate tectonics, and the ring of fire. Uh, and as you can see along the plate boundaries is where you see a lot of these active volcanoes, uh, right along these, and right along the Pacific plate, as you might know, like Hawaii and a lot of the Pacific Islands are all volcanic islands um, that were formed due to um, the active plate tectonics in this area. Uh, so now we'll go through convergent um, continent to continent. Like I said before, this is what's happening in the Himalayas. We have the uh, hard, not so heavy, um, continental crust of India that's moving uh, north into the Eurasian plate, creating lots of mountain building. Uh, here you go. You can see India is moving north uh, towards the Tibetan plateau, creating the Himalayas. Um, continental to continental um, convergence creates the biggest mountain ranges. Uh, so transfer boundaries, which we should all be familiar with because we live in California, um, with our most famous fault is the San Andreas Fault, is here because of the transform fault boundary. So the Pacific plate is moving <clears throat> while the North American plate is staying still, and this creates the San Andreas Fault. Uh, so we have divergent. Uh, this is when the two plates are moving away from each other. Um, here we have the North American plate is being pushed away from the Eurasian plate. Um, and in the center, we have the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, which is forming new oceanic crust. Um, or divergent can happen continental. Um, here we have the East African Rift Valley, where there is a zone of spreading um, on the land that's just pushing the African plate away from the Somali plate. So mantle convection uh, is what fuels a lot of the plate tectonic movements. So as <clears throat> a good example is when you 
boil a pot of water. When you are starting the boil, it's like a little bit of bubbles and then you get to a rolling bubble. And the bubbles from the bottom are moving from the bottom of the pot to the top. And they're actually making a circular motion. And we get that same concept in the Earth's core. So the core heats up mantle material. Um, and as it heats up, uh, the hot mantle rises and it hits the lithosphere. And as it hits the lithosphere, it starts to cool because now it's at the surface of the Earth. It's not, it's not getting as hot. So it actually starts to move down and create a circular motion. And this circular motion is called mantle convection and it's what drives plate tectonics. And so as you can see, um, due to subduction and then seafloor spreading, we have a lot of recycling of uh, crustal material throughout Earth's history. So here I wanna get started um, telling you guys how to get ready for this lab. Um, so for this lab, you are going to need to have Google Earth. There's no way to get around it. Um, so here are some basic instructions on how to get Google Earth to your um, computer. Uh, and if you have any issues with this, please reach out to me or to your TA. Uh, so go to Google Earth. Uh, com dash earth dash versions and click the icon for Google Earth Google Earth Pro on desktop. That's what you want. Um, if you do Google Earth on the web, it's not going to work because you will have to upload a document to this program. So next from there, you click accept and download. Uh, it should pop up at the bottom of your screen. You double click that, click run. Um, once you have uh, Google Earth downloaded, you are going to download the KMZ file that's within the lab folder. Um, and there are two ways to open this document. If you already have Google Earth downloaded, you can just double click this and click open in Google Earth. So right click open with Google Earth and it will uh, open up the KMZ file. Or if you just downloaded it, you can open Google Earth, click import, and then navigate to the folder where your KMZ is stored. And you may have to go to the change this to all files so that you can see it. Um, and then click dynamic earth geology, KMZ, and it would open up. So once you have it opened up, uh, there's gonna be a lot of different layers. Uh, you should play around with this if you've never used Google Earth. Um, turn on and off layers. If you click this little box here, you will turn off a layer. Um, and this will help you kind of see uh, some of the, the different activities a little bit better if you turn uh, layers that you aren't using on and off. Uh, if you have any questions, be sure to come to office hours. Um, or email your TA for help. Um, all right, so I am gonna actually switch this and we're gonna flip through the lab really quick. All right, so here is lab one. Sorry about that. Here is lab one. Uh, so our learning outcomes is that you will be able to identify and label the interior of the Earth's base based on composition and physical properties. You will be able to describe the relationship between density and thickness of the lithosphere and how it floats on the asthenosphere. Uh, you will be able to identify major geographic features um, and you will be able to calculate seafloor spreading rates. All right, so this is pretty basic. This reading is gonna really help you with your quiz to make sure that you get a good grade on your quiz. Um, I highly suggest doing this reading um, before you attempt the lab. So here's question one, just fill in the blanks. Um, if you are uh, typing this up, just A through E right here. Uh, all right, so for isostases, 
this uh, activity, you're going to want to click the link right here. Um, and then once you click the link, it's going to take you to a web page that has this where you calculate. Um, and you are going to uh, use this table right here to input different values in these boxes. So that's, and then you're going to click calculate and that's going to change it right here. So make sure that you edit what is in these boxes per this um, table so that you get the correct answer. And then when you need to get the elevation, you just hover over the boxes that are propagated once you click calculate, and that will give you the elevation of each block. Uh, if you have any questions on this, please email your TA. Um, then you'll have several questions that are about your block diagram. Um, so just go through these um, and try to answer them the best you can. Um, so now that we move on to the plate tectonics section, uh, and this is where you're going to need Google Earth. So make sure that you have Google Earth before you start this lab so that you're uh, not stressed out. Um, <clears throat> this reading also will help you complete this lab. Um, um, as you go through, these question eight should be on the side uh, on the side of your Google Earth. So this, all this information will already be within your KMZ file. But if you don't upload your KMZ file to Google Earth, you won't have any of the data you need for this activity. Um, you'll fill out this table. And then answer these uh, questions at the end. Um, here is a couple more instructions about getting started with Google Earth Pro. Um, if you need any additional help, please contact your TA um, or me. Uh, and that's all. Uh, good luck with the lab, and if you need any help, you know where to find us. <laughs>